there's no, no, no speed. speed control. It's either no speed or lopsided. PDFs are much harder to manipulate and that kind of stuff. So. The stars once spoke to men. It is world destiny that they are silent now. To be aware of the silence can become pain for earthly men. But in the deepening silence, there grows and ripens what man speaks to the stars. To be aware of the speaking can become strength for spirit men. Before I go on, any thoughts from yesterday that anybody wants to share from this verse? I'll share something. I, I get overwhelmed. I get tears in my eyes each time I work with this verse from where I am with this. These, these last three lines to me is really a synopsis of what the Western path is all about. And it's, it, to me, it's, it is so moving to feel this <coughs> question that the stars are asking. And from what I said in the beginning about Delphi, They've asked that question. That's the cosmic word. And they're waiting what we answer, what we reply. Do you know the term Rosicrucian? I, I assume most of you do. They, this group existed in the 13th, 14th, 15th century and worked as initiates amongst us. They didn't wear any special garb. They didn't identify themselves as being any different. They lived amongst all the people. And nobody knew they were Rosicrucian. But some books came out, and these books created quite a stir. So many a person <coughs> sought them out, tried to become a Rosicrucian. And today, there are Rosicrucian groups, and one out in California began because a person came and listened to Rudolf Steiner talking about the Rosicrucians and he was so excited, he went back to California and started his own Rosicrucian group. I'm not saying that's bad or good, um, and maybe my voice sounded, but I think that what Steiner had in mind is so much deeper than anything you can find. And he tries to say that what they had to work with at that time was so materialistic and so much in the direction of materialism that it was very, very difficult for them to work at that time. <clears throat> but they were working with the concepts of alchemy. And he goes on to say that what we Today, as anthroposophists or spiritual scientists, need, I'll just slide it over a little bit, and then I, I won't be feeling like I'm dodging your eyesight, but um, is, is that what we bring has to be Rosicrucian. What does that mean? It means to me that we have to start from where science is today. We have to be where technology is today, and we can be in the driver's seat to some extent and try to steer things to a healthy future. <clears throat> but there's only so much of that we can do. Don't, and, and we can't have a picture that says, oh, that's bad, I'm gonna steer to what I think is the good. Because <coughs> as soon as you do that, you jump right into Lucifer's domain or somebody else's. One of the themes that we brought up last night is, is that the sort of theme of God works in mysterious ways, that we are facing severe challenges in our time because we have to grow stronger 
in our spiritual work. We are working now on what's starting to call the consciousness soul. We've completed the development of the intellectual soul somewhat. And before that, the sentient soul. We became aware of our senses. We could connect our senses with concepts and throughout the intellectual soul. But now we're developing something much deeper. And that development happens inside the intellectual soul. So this importance that we must accept our epoch as it, as it actually is, but endeavor to influence it spiritually, says everything, I think, right now on, on this uh, slide. So, and back to this question, what are we? Well, the Bible tells us that we are soma, psyche, and pneuma, body, soul, and spirit. And so I made a diagram, um, and there's an interesting correlation in Egyptian times, if you see this bottom triangle as being moved up so that it fits here, you would have Egyptian time where when they looked out at the pyramids in the morning or in the evening, with the gold leafing around those pyramids, that the sun would be reflected in such a way that they would see the pyramid from above descending to the physical. It was heaven and earth combined. Then we have the descent of this, so that we now have a part of our soul that dies into the body. Steiner calls the brain one of the most physical parts of our body. And our thinking has gone through the etheric and now resides in the brain, which is why we have materialistic thinking prevailing today. But that thinking, he calls it dead thinking, because it's no longer connected to the etheric body. And he says, in our time, we need to develop living thinking. So we have the part that can, of our soul that can reach into the spirit, and this is what we need to develop in balance to the part that reaches into the body. So the ages that we're in, the Yana space that I showed last night, um, we are here in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age. And we've been through earlier ages, epochs, four epochs, this is the fifth, and we have two more to go afterwards. And we also have two more post-Atlantean <coughs> cultural ages, and each one of these lasts roughly 2,160 years, where the time it takes the sun to go through one of the um, zodiac signs of the precession of the equinoxes. So if you do the math out, each of these would have had seven of those, and seven times 2,160, you know, and times seven, and I don't know, you do the math. <laughs> um, that's, kind of how long the earth and its physicality can last. We need some air movement here. Mm -hmm. One of the, I, I, I'll just put this up for a moment. One can diagram each of those cultural epochs with the Indian right after the Atlantean time being essentially the circle the oneness of everything, pervaded Vedic philosophy. And we get to Persian times, we now have to draw it as an ellipse because there's essentially a duality that's arising in their philosophy. And this duality in Egyptian times begins to start separating, but it still has this connection until we get to Egyptian times when it's in balance. And Steiner says this is the height, the peak of human physical evolution occurred during the Egyptian, I mean during the Greek time, until we get to our modern times where essentially spirit and physical have separated. And so we become monistic, either as a materialist or monistic 
in terms of spiritual or dualists in saying these two never meet. We have no way of knowing how we get from consciousness to matter or from matter to consciousness. These Cassini ones, we won't go into those, but I thought it was interesting how you get plant forms and so on out of these not this mathematical equation. But, but I did want to show a diagram of our spiritual evolution, a sort of descent into Atlantean times. And this is a descent in that our interaction with the spiritual world is sliding away from us, so to speak. And at the same time, our physical evolution is continuing to rise so that in the Atlantean times, we, we have this kind of meeting of our spiritual evolution with our physical evolution. And then since that, we've been in a devolution period. Now, this is approximately where we are, so we should be on a spiritual ascent. Um, it's also interesting, back in Lemurian times, just before the ego enters into the constitution, we can't really call it a physical body, we don't have that till here, but into the constitution that we have an etheric body as its lowest body, we start having electricity enter. Now we'll take that up at the workshop a lot more, but it's interesting, if we had no physical body, what does that tell us about electricity? Okay, and one last sort of uh, uh, slide to help us get into tonight. I have a history here of the development of computers, and I'm not actually going to go over all of this, but I want to jump down to 1959. When I joined IBM in 1973, it was entirely men, except for secretaries. Entirely men. I worked for, at the Investment New York Wendell Lab for 4,000 employees, and every single engineer and manager was a male. The way programming was done in its early years before Admiral Grace Hopper got involved, was brute force. They would write code, load this, add this, store that. If it was this, go, they didn't have a go here. If it was this, they would say jump so many megabytes or bytes down. And if it wasn't that, jump somewhere else megabytes down in the code. And programmers back then were so proud of their ability to remember all of these jumps. And as they changed code, the distance you had to jump if you inserted something would change. And so software was failing all the time, all the time. And then a woman comes along. And if you remember our discussion about Lucifer and Araman, and masculine and feminine, it took a woman to say, this is nonsense, guys. We can do better than that. And she developed machine-independent programming languages, which led to COBOL. It became the programming language for businesses from the 60s till we hit the year 2000, when everyone was afraid that all this old COBOL stuff was going to fall apart and break. And one other very interesting fact. We've had a number of Apollo missions. We don't have them anymore, do we? And the Russians sent three spacecraft to the moon, and we brought back rocks from these. They shouldn't. So homeopathically, within the Earth, we now have these rocks. But we've tested a lot of them, and we found something quite fascinating. It's completely confirmed today. Those rocks came from the Earth. They have this same isotopic signature that the Earth rocks have. So now they're busy coming up with theories that there used to be some planet, they gave it a name.